A lady in my former parish was turning 95 in 2020, and it was in April, so it was one of those times at the height of the pandemic when the fire department used to do parades for birthdays. Do you remember that? How every once in a while, if somebody was having a major birthday, the local volunteer fire department would come by your house with all the sirens going so that if you couldn't have a Sweet 16 party, you could at least have this great big moment in your front yard. Well, I was from a small town in the Hudson Valley where they did things like that during COVID. And so it was her 95th birthday, so there she was, out on the front steps of the church, all of us six feet apart, waving as the parade went by, all the local firefighters with all the sirens going. And I asked her at that birthday about how it felt to be 95, and she goes, well, I think a lot about dying. She said, you know, a lot of my friends, they all want to die in their sleep. They say, I hope I die in my sleep. She said, but that's not what I want. I want to die wide awake. I want to look in the faces of my kids and my grandkids and thank them. I want to thank them for being a part of my life. And I don't want them to be afraid of me dying. And she goes, sure, if I'm awake, maybe it'll hurt. But if it hurts a little, I'll deal with it. I want my death to be a blessing. She wanted her death to be a blessing. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered your death being a blessing? The fact that we're all going to die means that our death is going to be something. It's going to be something. It's going to be one thing or another. So if it's going to be something, can we allow it to be a blessing? We have to use it somehow because we're not going to avoid it. No one ever has. So how can we allow it to be a blessing? In monasteries, they have a technique for this. They use the Latin phrase, memento mori, which means remember death. They say it to each other. They say it sometimes in their prayer services. Memento mori. Let's remember we're all going to die someday, so let's make sure today is a day toward that being a blessing. You know, all of us get a taste of that on Ash Wednesday when they say, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Memento mori. A lot of us think about offering our lives to something. And I don't know if you've ever said that about somebody. You know, we'll often do that at someone's retirement or at their jubilee. We'll say, she's given her life to education or he's given his life to making Glens Falls a better place. We'll hear people say that. But have you ever considered giving your death? A lot of people want to give their life to something, but would you ever consider dedicating your death to something worthy? One spiritual writer says that we need to remember that death is the finishing touch on God's masterpiece. It's the finishing touch. And if we think about what an incredible gift Jesus' life was, we have to admit that it's impossible, as wonderful as his life was, it's impossible to fully understand him unless we consider his death. We can't just consider his life. Many of you are wearing right now, around your neck, or as a pin somewhere, a a memorial of him giving his death to us, not just his life to us. And that's what he's talking about tonight. He says, if a grain of wheat is living, it's a grain of wheat. But once it dies, a grain of wheat can yield a rich harvest. It can be the finishing touch on a masterpiece, on a wonderful season, and then go into the soil and allow there to be growth for the future. Memento Mori is a chance for us to stay grounded. When we remember, huh, life is short. I'm not going to be here forever. It can help us stay focused on what we're supposed to do with the life we have. I mean, whatever life you have right now, whatever life I have, those are the cards we've been dealt. We've been dealt a hand of cards. 
And Memento Mori says, those are your cards. You going to play them or what? You don't have endless time, so you're going to want to play that hand. And sometimes the cards we're dealt are not easy to have. You know, it's kind of like if the card that you're dealt is that you wound up getting a gene for some addiction like alcoholism, you got it. It was one of the cards you were dealt. And so then you have to decide, so how do I want this story to end? Between now and the time I die, how do I want this to go? What do I want this time to be used for? Whatever the cards I've been dealt, what am I going to do with those cards between now and death? One thing that a friend of mine does is say, what lesson do I want my kids to learn from watching this? So if I've been handed the addiction card, what do I want their kids to say about the way their mom or dad dealt with the addiction? How am I going to play the, the hand of my difficult childhood or the trauma that I had when I was young? How am I going to use my affliction that I've had, either having lupus or, or MS or some other persistent problem? If those are the cards I've been dealt, how am I going to play them? Many of you will remember that Mother Teresa was this figure that was probably held up as one of the greatest role models for most of our lifetimes. For those who were privileged to live while she was alive, we always thought of her as a living saint. And then she died in 1997. And 10 years later, her diaries were released. Do you remember that? And they were actually hard to read. Do you remember that we were shocked by her diaries? They were sad. It turned out she had years and years and years of depression. She had dealt with a lot of hard things. And a lot of what she wrote there was that she felt like God was far away from her. Isn't that interesting? It was like unthinkable for us who thought of her as a living saint, but she said that she often felt abandoned by God, like she wasn't good enough for God. And then in her diaries, she said, what am I going to do about this feeling that I have? How can I use this to make something better in the world? And what she wrote was amazing. She said, if I ever do get to be a saint, I want to be a saint who helps people in darkness. She said, I don't think I'm going to spend much time in heaven if I'm a saint. She said, I think I'm going to roam around the world trying to bring light to the darkness on earth. Having a darkness was the hand she was dealt. But she was thinking about her death. How can I use this to help people after I'm dead even? I got to know about a beloved member of this parish from the past by getting to know her daughter, who just recently lost her husband. The, the woman that we were talking about was Evelyn Sirocco. Maybe some of you remember that name. She graduated from our school. She was a tremendous lady. And she lived into her 90s. But most people don't know that she was married at one point. They may know she had a daughter, but her husband died when she was barely out of her 40s. And so she spent over 40 years as a widow. And she asked herself, how do I want to use this affliction? I can't believe that I've been widowed so young. What do I want to do with it? How can I, how can I allow it to be a blessing? And so her daughter told me that one of the things she did was read the obituaries every day, and she would scan the obituary to find people who had no survivors. And then she would go to the funeral. She said, who better than me to know what a loss feels like? I don't want them to be there alone. Imagine it's hard enough they've lost someone. Now imagine being in the funeral home and no one shows up. She said, I won't let that happen. I go to all those funerals. She was the friendly lady at the funerals that no one knew. They probably thought she was there thinking there was going to be a reception, but there was no reception. She wasn't there for the crab dip. She was there for the people. Jesus said in the gospel, when the grain of wheat has the courage to give up its life for the harvest, then there can be an amazing bounty. It has to fall to the ground and die first, and then God can do something with that. And that's, you know exactly what it's like for us to come here. It's unbelievable what we get to do.
We hear about his life, we remember his death, and then we, we partake of the harvest every week. We receive his body. There's more than enough for all of us. A, a, a life that was contained 2,000 years ago in Palestine is now here in Glens Falls, 2,000 years later. And we don't just get to spend time with him. We don't just get to commune with him or bump into him. We get to bring him into our bodies and our lives. We, we get to, to allow him to become part of us and strengthen us so we can face all the things. He doesn't just nourish us in some poetic way or some metaphoric kind of way. No, it's real. It's true. You know that, and so do I. He offered his life to us, but he also offered his death to us. So what about you? What about me? What are we going to do with our one precious life And what are we going to do with our one precious death?